So a lot of what you're saying sounds like you think that doctors could practice medicine better, or at least do better research if they understood more evolutionary biology. Well, I think that's true in some parts of medicine and not so true in others. The parts of medicine where it's probably really important are in infectious disease, where evolutionary thinking really gives important insights into the way resistance develops in reaction to antibiotic treatment. That's one. Another is in cancer biology, where uh, evolutionary thinking helps us to understand why chemotherapy fails and suggests ways to get around that. Um, and I think that there are some areas where it points to some things we're not so sure of, but if they are true, they are very concerning. For example, if we use imperfect vaccines, in a big well, what's an imperfect vaccine? An, an imperfect vaccine is a vaccine that does not sterilize everyone that it's given to. So every, it means every, some, every virus or, or every virus. So if we give it to 500 million people, and let's say it works in 300 million of them, and in 200 million of them, it doesn't work. We would call that vaccine 60 percent effective. Okay, but it would be imperfect. Sounds helpful. It sounds very helpful. It saves millions of lives. However, the question is, which pathogens survive that kind of treatment? And the answer appears to be that over the course of repeated vaccinations and generations of this kind of, of treatment, it is the more virulent ones. So I understand that this has not been shown to be a major problem for human vaccines, but for poor chickens and Merrick's virus, it's been really a serious problem. It's certainly been a serious problem in uh, domestic chickens, and it's also been demonstrated experimentally in mice infected with malaria. So we know that there's proof of concept. We know so, you, so you give the vaccine and some individuals get protection, but this gets a, really creates a selection force for on the virus to make it more nasty. More nasty, that's right. And it's due to a life history trade-off. How is that a life history trade-off? It's a trade-off between virulence and transmission. And what's happening is that before the vaccine was invented, the pathogen was at an evolutionary equilibrium of a certain kind. What, what do you mean an evolutionary equilibrium? It didn't hurt its host too much because it had to let its host survive long enough so that it could be transmitted. Got it. Okay. However, when the vaccine comes along, it cuts down the cost of hurting the host. Mm -hmm. And it's been pretty clearly shown that in these imperfect vaccines, what they do is they extend the lifespan of the uh -huh. person who's there, during which period the nasty virus can get transmitted. Fascinating. So I was taught in medical school that when a new pathogen, virus or bacteria, came into a new species, that over time it just became more and more mild, inevitably. And after a few you know, thousand generations, it wouldn't be so much problem anymore. Is that a correct generalization? No, that's actually uh, an, a misapplication of evolutionary thinking. So a doctor's trying to do evolution but not doing it right. That's right. That's exactly what's going on because that will happen if the only way that that pathogen gets transmitted is from mother to offspring, from parent to child. That's called vertical transmission. If the way that... Through, through the egg or through something. Through the egg or something like that or through milk or whatever. But if the pathogen is transmitted horizontally, which means that it could be transmitted from one child to another. Anybody to anybody. Really. Anybody to anybody at school or wherever, then uh, all bets are off. And what will happen usually is the pathogen will evolve to an intermediate level of virulence at which point it's still pretty nasty. And whatever level of virulence, whatever level of nastiness maximizes its transmission no matter what happens to the host? That's right. It doesn't care at all about the host. It's just trying to maximize its own transmission. And so it will become less nasty if that helps it to transmit. It will become more nasty if that helps it to transmit. So certain means of transmission, like mosquitoes, uh, seem to shape increased levels of nastiness for that reason, because uh, you don't have to be up and around to transmit. Well, that's right, and it's very advantageous uh, for a disease transmitted by a mosquito to put its uh, host into a state where that host is lying down, exposed, for a long period of time. For more mosquitoes to bite it. For more mosquitoes to bite it. Which is why malaria kills so many millions of people still. Yes. What a dire worldwide plague and so much money and time and energy put into it, 
And both the mosquitoes and the malaria pathogen continue to escape our best attempts to control it or eradicate it. Well, it is a puzzle, and there are some attempts to solve it by using very modern high-tech means like gene drive to drive genes into populations and force them to extinction. So what, what could be extinguished, the malaria or the mosquito the or mosquito. both? Mosquito. This would be done in the mosquito. So, uh, so let's see if we can explain in very simple terms how that might work. Well, what, what is a gene drive? That's the question. Right. It is a gene that makes sure that instead of getting into the sperm or the egg in a nice fair 50-50 ratio, that it gets into 90 or 100 percent of the sperm in the eggs. So it's not playing fair. It is not playing fair, and if it is linked to a gene that makes the mosquito die young or be incapable of transmitting the disease, then uh, it will drive the mosquito population to extinction or it will make it incapable of transmitting the disease. So in a certain way, you could vaccinate all mosquitoes against malaria and by having a gene drive that prevents them from getting malaria, and you'd still get bit, but you wouldn't get malaria. It sounds really good, doesn't it? We don't but, know, but, we, but, 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 but we don't know what the consequences are of actually taking an entire species out of a natural ecosystem. You know, many people reminded me that we're not missing smallpox much, or polio, but those are different. Those are viruses, and they aren't interacting with as many other things. Uh, and it's not only that, well, maybe taking a mosquito out of the African continent might not be such a big deal, it's what are we going to do next? What is the next thing that we might decide to take out and who's going to decide? So here's your chance to prognosticate on television tape for people to watch decades hence. Do you think that we are going to be able to create responsible plans and constraints on this or is it just going to go on its own willy-nilly and people do things? I think that there will be well-intentioned attempts to be responsible and I think they will be undermined by the human perversity that characterizes all known history. The human perversity that characterizes all known history. You may get a reputation as a cynic, doctor. I'm not a cynic. It's just another name for a realist. <laughs> <laughs>